Every D&D adventuring party has to deal with the threat of death and dismemberment lurking around every corner. And somebody's going to be the poor sap that has to pick up all the pieces afterwards. And if that somebody is you, you might be playing the healer in your next Dungeons & Dragons campaign. Today, we're going to be looking at the spells, class features, and other abilities that you can use to stock your medical cabinet, patch your party back together, and get back into the fight. My name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we discuss everything Dungeons & Dragons, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos every Thursday, so please subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Today, we are discussing how to play a healer in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. This role can be very rewarding, but it's sometimes a thankless one as well, regardless of the fact that it's often essential to the survival of your adventuring party as they embark on their adventures through dangerous environments, dangerous dungeons, and other hazardous places of the world. Most adventurers talk about their feats in battle, how much damage they can do, and the monsters that they slay. But being an important part of the team means filling in all of those different gaps, including somebody who needs to be there to get that party on their feet and let them keep doing that damage in combat. This is where the healer really comes into play. So let's open up our med kits and let's get rolling. So Kelly, if we think about the play style and the concept of a healer in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, what are they going to do and how are they going to do it? Well, the idea here is that in the game of Dungeons & Dragons, there's so many different monsters that are going to wreak havoc on your party. There's going to be players mm. that fall in combat. Uh, your frontline fighters might get hit pretty hard quite a few times. And being the person who stands up for that party makes sure that they're still on their feet through those combats and also outside of combat helps them get bolstered for the next fight that they have to go into or helps them just tend to their wounds. And really, you're the biggest team player in the dynamic of the party. They're the one who looks around and says, who needs help the most and how can I help them? Yeah, in that way, a healer is the beating heart of the party. They keep everyone going through the war of attrition that is combat and exploration in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. Whether that's just taking damage from traps, running into diseases or curses or magical effects, or getting beat up in combat, a healer's role is to quell those problems, to put out those fires, to heal those wounds, and make sure that the party can go on into the next fight. That is one thing that I look at when I'm creating a healer, is it's not just about hit points. It's not just about getting hit points back up. It is about things like diseases and traps and different types of monsters and uh, th curses and all of these things are, that are going to negatively affect your party. Your job is to find a solution for those problems. Now, many people feel that having a healer is an essential role in a Dungeons & Dragons party. And many dungeon masters get very trepidatious when the player characters are creating their characters during session zero and nobody's chosen the cleric or no, the bard didn't choose any healing spells or there isn't a paladin or someone that has some sort of healing magic to bring to the table. And often I see many DMs feel that this means that they need to either force a player to play a healer or create an NPC to follow along with the party. The thing is, we've gotten by many campaigns without a character playing a dedicated healer. We usually have somebody who takes a couple healing abilities, but there are ways that you can manage it where a healer isn't a necessary part. It is a very helpful part, Yes. but you could split the healer amongst three people with a healing spell each. Mm -hmm. and call that a good healing team. You, you would have your kit there between all the characters. So I think the strategies that we're looking at, you could apply them all to one dedicated character, but across an entire party, if you have a smattering of abilities on one character and another player has taken a few options of others, you'll actually be just as fine as if you had a dedicated character for that. And you can compensate for this. Good battlefield control... Uh, strong coordination and teamwork from a party and really excellent damage dealers may make a healer feel like dead weight. Sometimes. It's possible to blow the doors off an encounter and walk away without taking a scratch. But in my experience, that's pretty rare. And if a party's on a winning streak on that, that usually means the dungeon master is going to 
up the heat a little bit, up the ante and make things harder. This is also why when you're sitting down to play a healer, you should also talk to the rest of your party. If you're thinking, I'm going to play a life domain cleric and be the dedicated healer, but you also have a bard, a druid, and a paladin who are all taking a few healing spells, then that's almost overkill and yeah. your, your yeah. role in the party becomes less effective and you'll feel less important mm -hmm. if everybody else is already adding to that healing pool. Yep. Another really important thing to understand about the healer playstyle in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition is that healing in Dungeons & Dragons is not like healing in many video games, particularly massively multiplayer online games and computer role-playing games, where often you need a dedicated healer who is constantly casting healing spells to keep the party topped up, otherwise they'll just die instantly. That type of playstyle does not exist in Dungeons and Dragons because if you do that, you're probably going to run out of all your spell slots and there's no mana regeneration. The game mechanics of D&D haven't been really built around that at all. So with all that in mind, let's talk about how healing works in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition and take a look at the pros and cons of being a healer. Healing in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition is reliable, but inefficient. The reason why it's reliable is because healing spells just work. There's no saving throw, there's no attack roll, they're not going to miss, they're not going to fail. Sure, you might roll high on the dice of hit points restored or low on the dice of hit points restored, but many healing spells in D&D also attach an ability score modifier or have some reliability to them, so you can really count on them working. This is what makes playing a healer such a rewarding experience, is the reliability of being a healer. The fact that you always know you can count on those spells to do something beneficial for your party. Yeah, there will be very rare exceptions. For example, you might be facing an enemy that uses the chill touch cantrip to prevent you from healing, or you might run into a particularly nefarious villain that decides to counterspell your life-saving healing word. But barring these exceptions, your healing is going to be functional most of the time, and you're always going to be able to count on those abilities working and having some kind of impact. But on the other side of that, healing is somewhat inefficient if that's all that you're doing. There's two reasons for this. First of all, some healing spells do have some positional requirements to them. You often need to run right up to the target you want to heal to touch them, or there's a limited range to how far those spells last. But worst of all, the amount of healing that a healing spell restores is often far less than the amount of damage that many monsters and characters can deal. For example, Cure Wounds restores 1d8 plus your spellcasting modifier in hit points, but a basic orc can do that much damage or more to you in a single turn. So really, you're only getting back about the same amount as a crossbow bolt hitting you or a longsword. If you look at a third level spell like Fireball, which deals 86 points of damage on a failed saving throw, Mass Cure Wounds, also a third level spell, only restores 3d8 points of damage. So against creatures that fail their saving throws against a Fireball, the healing spell isn't going to heal them up, and even creatures which succeed their saving throws against the Fireball might not get all of their hit points back. Now, of course, you can take class features and other abilities that allow you to restore more hit points and get more out of your spells, but point for point, blow for blow, healing in Dungeons and Dragons is almost always going to fall behind the damage output of dedicated damage dealers and monsters. It might be possible for a dedicated healer to focus all of their abilities on keeping somebody alive with their healing spells while they're taking hits constantly, but this is going to be really resource intensive and ultimately might be wasteful. If you heal your way through a fight and use all your spell slots, what's going to happen in the next battle? I think it's important to know that if you are setting out to play the healer in Dungeons and Dragons and you go in with the mentality that you are going to keep the whole party at maximum hit points through every combat, you're going to be very disappointed. The better idea is to think of it more like you're the ER nurse and you need to triage what's going on on the battlefield. Wherever the most damage is being dealt, whoever's about to go down, you need to solve problems as they come up. 
Really, you're the problem solver more so than the person who's going to keep everybody capped up at max hit points. Great healers know how to use their abilities at critical moments in battle and then help tend the wounded after the conflict is over. As a healer, you really want to focus in on three main things. The first is to contribute to the battle proactively. Prevent incoming damage by finding a way to help win that fight. The second is preventing death on the battlefield by reviving fallen allies and getting them back into the fight. And the final thing is aiding that recovery after the battle is over and keeping the party up and running during exploration and other moments outside the fight. Really, if you look at these three core elements, the first one is preventing damage in the first place, which should be your main focus. After that, then the healing comes into play. There's many different classes in D&D that work as a healer, but regardless of which one you pick, there are some key spells that we're going to want to look at to really build a good healer for Dungeons and Dragons. Now, the first two spells on our list are Cure Wounds and Mass Cure Wounds. And this is so much not to encourage you to use them, but to discourage you from using them. These two spells are actually incredibly inefficient, and if you are planning to use them, they should only be used in clutch moments when you have no other choice to stop an ally from dying. You should absolutely not use these spells to top people up. In fact, the use case for these spells is so narrow, I think that you can play an excellent healer through an entire campaign and never cast these spells. There is almost always a better alternative in the moment. Unless you know that this spell is going to restore enough hit points that a party member can survive the next hit that they're going to take, it's probably worth considering doing something else instead. On the other hand, an absolutely indispensable spell is Healing Word. And the addition of Healing Word to the game, I think, really helps the healer class feel powerful in their healing. I think Healing Word is important for two reasons. First of all, unlike Cure Wounds, it has range and it's cast as a bonus action instead of an action. So this means that you as a healer have way more flexibility with Healing Word. But on the other hand, it doesn't restore as many hit points. And so I feel that Healing Word has one key purpose, and that is saving the life of a dying ally. And even if you are saving the life of a dying ally, sometimes it's not enough hit points to make the total difference in battle. But the fact that it's a bonus action, it's a low level spell, actually gives you enough room to play around with it and use it effectively. Yeah, and if you do need to turn the tide across several characters, you could use a spell like Mass Healing Word. If several of your party members have gone down, you're probably in a really desperate situation and you need to run. And so that's one situation where using a spell like Mass Cure Wounds might give your allies the hit points they need to stay standing long enough to flee. <laughs> but that's about it. Um, I think that anyone that has gone down in combat, counting on Mass Cure Wounds, Healing Word, Cure Wounds, and all these spells to bring them back into the fight and keep fighting is a little bit too much to hope for. Honestly, the amount of times that I've seen somebody knock down to zero hit points, they're bleeding out, a healer raises them back up, but then they usually end up spending their next turn downing a potion anyway because the healer got them back alive, but not at a point where they were okay to continue fighting in battle. So there is a little bit of a statement there in the fact that a healer can't just be like, you're back in the fight and they're good to go. Usually it's not enough hit points to do yeah. that. Yeah, so when you are using these spells, you really need to think one step ahead and be like, if I'm going to healing word to bring the fighter back into combat, what's going to happen between now and the moment that they get their next turn? Because if you cast healing word on the fighter and before their turn comes around, the orc runs up to them and hits them with a great axe and knocks them down again, that was a complete waste of healing word. Whereas if you cast the same spell on that fighter, they get back up and they slay that orc before that orc can act. That was really worthwhile. So it is important to not use these spells just willy nilly and really to assess the situation and whether or not that party member is going to be able to contribute something by bringing them back up in that moment or whether you're just going to be delaying the inevitable. So Monty, you're the healer in your party. No, you're, yeah. you're going up against a dragon. We already talked about how healing spells are not always going to be the best choice, but you still want to be that healer. 
what what skills, abilities, spells, what are we going to look at to really bolster our allies? Well, this is where being a healer can be proactive because you can plan ahead and use mechanics like temporary hit points to raise up the threshold of your party. Often, the ways of granting the party temporary hit points or bolstering their maximum hit points are things that are going to carry through throughout the day or not going to cost you too many resources. My favorite in this respect is the combination of the inspiring leader feat and the aid spell. Yes, we've talked about this in other episodes before, but inspiring leader is a speech that you can give to give temporary hit points to your entire party at like the beginning of the day. It's quite a lot too. It's a number of hit points equal to each character's hit dice plus your charisma modifier. But even if you don't have that charisma modifier, that's a lot of extra hit points that are granted to the party every time they take a short rest. And then if you combine that with something like the aid spell, one of the misconceptions with the aid spell is people look at it and say, oh, there's that rule that you can't stack up more temporary hit points. But the aid spell doesn't. The aid spell actually brings up your hit point maximum. Mm -hmm. So you can combine both of these together to bring up your maximum hit points and then stack temporary hit points on top. And incidentally, increases to your maximum hit points do stack as long as they are coming from different spells or abilities. So once you get to higher levels and you get a spell like Hero's Feast, which also increases your hit point maximum, you can apply Hero's Feast, Inspiring Leader, and Aid together, and you're going to see your entire party gaining 30 or more hit points on top of their base hit points. That's enough that now your party can soak a fireball. <laughs> and if you want everybody at the table to thank you later for being a good healer, this is actually the better way to do it. You're technically the healer who's bolstering them before battle, mm -hmm. and they will notice when they get hit, and they're like, I'm not even into my normal hit point range yet. Yeah. And that is important. And what's amazing about these abilities too is that when, once you've cast things like Hero's Feast and Aid and Inspiring Leader, if the party takes all that damage later, when they get the opportunity to take a short rest or use other healing spells and abilities to top them back up, that hit point maximum comes back. Those temporary hit points come back when you take a short rest. So these are resources that you can lay down at the start of an adventuring day, and they're going to continue to pay dividends throughout the course of the day. And that's why they're really good to use. On top of all that, there are some really good niche protection spells that actually don't require concentration. Protection from poison. Poison is a very common thing that can happen to a player. There's a lot of creatures out there that can poison them. I, I think poison is the most common damage type right up there with fire and just straight up weapon damage. And protection from poison is a second level spell that grants resistance to poison damage that doesn't require concentration. It's just a buff that lasts for an hour. You cast it, you go off into battle or touring through a jungle full of poisonous snakes, or if you know that you're going to be dealing with poison, you just cast it and no concentration required, and now your party's way better off. Yeah, so finding these tricky ways that you can prepare in advance will really help your party in the long term and really lessen the load on the amount of healing spells that you need to cast in battle. If you can cast one spell now and save yourself later, that's going to be really, really key. This actually ties really nicely into our next topic, which is how to recover after battle. As a healer, you need to encourage your party to take short rests wisely and intelligently use their hit dice to restore their hit points. In fact, your party members should be spending their hit dice before you're spending your spell slots on them. If they have hit dice remaining and you have an hour of time to spend on a rest, you got to break those out before you use your spells because otherwise you're just wasting that resource. A lot of uh, a lot of parties go into their short rest and say, "Hey, healer, let's top us all up." And they completely ignore the fact that they have many other ways to get themselves back into the fight. A player's hit dice give them a pool of extra hit points that are approximately equal to their maximum hit points, which means that if a player character gets beat up down to half hit points, takes a short rest, they can then bump themselves up to full HP again and still be able to do that once more 
without costing the healer any resources whatsoever. Really, every player character has double their maximum hit points with the inclusion of a short rest between battles. Exactly. Another great option if you're planning to play the healer is to take the healer feat. When you take the healer feat, it just means that you can use a healer's kit during a short rest to grant a player 1d6 plus 4 plus their level in healing. In many cases, the healer feat is enough to top up someone in the back lines of the party, like the rogue or the wizard who took a stray arrow shot, because oftentimes the damage dealt to the party isn't even. It's usually the fighters, the paladins, and the barbarians that took a lot of damage, and the people in the back line often don't need a lot of healing unless they got into trouble. We would be remiss not to mention one of the additions from Xanathar's Guide to Everything to the spell list that most people deem a little overpowered, and that is Healing Spirit. Healing Spirit is a second level druid and ranger spell that restores 1d6 hit points to someone standing inside it. And many people have talked about how this spell can be used outside of combat to restore many, many hit points because you just ask every party member to constantly be running through the healing spirit while you're concentrating on it. So that means that with one second level spell slot, you can restore 35 hit points on average to every character in your party, which is amazing and makes druids these amazing out of combat healers. Yeah, it's it was actually kind of unexpected to see uh, that that spell jumps druid pretty high on the list of good healers just from using this one spell. Now, this is a little bit of an unexpected use of this spell out of combat because it's pretty balanced when it's used in combat to only restore 1d6 hit points to someone that runs through it. But when it's used out of combat, it is a stellar amount of healing. And oftentimes this means that the spell gets banned by DMs or house ruled in some way. And we've argued for in the past, I still think that the healing spirit spell is powerful, but not a go-to. I still think that you should use your short rest first before you use this spell. Yeah, if you have the option to take a short rest and use your hit dice, it's still going to be a better option than wasting a second level spell to get your party back up and running. They can already do that if you can take a short yeah. rest. Healing Spirit becomes really useful when you finish up a combat and you know that there's another combat coming and you only have a couple minutes to figure something out to get you and your party back up and running for that next battle. That's when Healing Spirit is useful and I think that that actually makes it a really good spell. Not one that's overpowered, but one that you can use in those key moments to really help out. Healing Spirit is often compared to spells like Prayer of Healing and Aura of Vitality all of which are spells that take about one minute to restore hit points to a group of player characters. And I feel that you should still measure your out of combat healing resources carefully. I would always use the short rest before I had to use a spell slot. I'm now picturing Monty as the cleric and there's like one of your party members lying down bleeding out and he's like, I need help. And you're like, take a rest. Just have a nap, man. Sleep Rub some up. dirt in it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not I'm not wasting my magic on you. Mm -hmm. Your spell slots for all the classes that have healing spells, any of the spells that you cast, for all the for all the classes that can be dedicated healers, they have the chance to use one of their spell slots to win a combat encounter, to turn the tide. But it's unlikely that a healing spell is gonna be the spell that wins the battle unless it's giving the assist to somebody else who's gonna come back and cast that spell. So you always wanna measure how many resources you devote to healing outside combat versus keeping those spell slots live. You may wanna end up using those spell slots for other spells that are equally important for helping and protecting the party, but aren't necessarily healing spells. Things like Dispel Magic, or Revivify, or Raise Dead. It's also important to bring spells like Lesser and Greater Restoration for getting rid of those really nasty curses, permanent status conditions, and otherwise, because you can't get rid of those things any other way but these spells. There's so many other ways to get hit points back, but the only way to fix death is Revivify, Raise Dead, and Resurrection. The only way to end a curse is Remove Curse. The only way to help a party member that's been turned to stone is greater restoration. You can you can dish out healing spells all you want, but if one of your party members gets hit by a mummy and ends up with a mummy's curse, and you're the one player who can say, oh, I got that, and remove that curse, that's what's going to make you a hero. 
What if you run into that problem where your party's getting beaten up, you're taking a lot of damage, you gotta get somebody back in the fight, you need to get somebody back in the fight because they're just taking such big hits. How can we deal with that? I think one of the underdog spells for a healer or for anybody to take who can bolster your party is Polymorph. Yes, I completely agree. This spell is so tricksy as a healer because you can have that situation where the fighters reduce down to 10 hit points and then you polymorph them into a giant ape that now has like 130 hit points and can just take all those hits again. That's the hidden secret of polymorph is a lot of people look at polymorph and they say, oh, I'll use this tactically to get in and out of places. I'll use it to uh, turn our fighter into a T-Rex or a giant ape or some other great thing in combat. But there's also that little added part where they get to take on the hit points of the creature that you turn yeah. them into. Yes. So suddenly your fighter who got surrounded by gnolls and is now getting pummeled on the ground and is just watching their hit points drop gets to stand up as a giant ape with 130 hit points and keep swinging in that battle. It's so easy to forget that with polymorph, the creature polymorph takes on the hit points of that form regardless of what their original hit point total was the only time it doesn't work is you can't polymorph someone that's at zero hit points no but your fighter goes down to one you can be like now you're something else yeah and that for a fourth level spell slot is going to put way more hit points back on the board than any other healing spell that you can cast in combat it's even going to be a bigger swing than heal which is a sixth level spell the heal spell will recover 70 hit points to a player, which is great if the wizard got really be beat up and they need to stay in the fight so they can concentrate on the wall of fire or so that they can keep throwing fireballs and counter spells. But if the character is not going to need their own class abilities, polymorphing them and letting them go to town from there is a great solution. So we've talked about a ton of spells, abilities, and feats and a loose collection of things that are all useful tools, but we now need to bring this together and decide what class are we going to play to leverage all these abilities going forward. And I think that there's a lot of options. There are. Um, as we said at the top, it's possible to have a party that has a paladin, a ranger, um, a celestial warlock, a divine soul sorcerer, and that spreads these abilities out across all of them and does perfectly fine. If that's your party, you probably have enough healing amongst everybody that you're going to be more than okay. Yeah. But if you want to play the dedicated healer, I think the three that always stand out to me are the Bard, the Cleric, and the Druid. I agree. So let's start with the Bard. Why would we choose the Bard for our dedicated healer? Uh, the Bard gets magical secrets, so they get to pick up spells from other classes. They can take yeah. a handful of healing spells anyway on their spell list, and they have a lot of ways to buff and bolster the party. I completely agree. With the Bard, you have the advantage of your charisma-based spellcaster, so you can pick up Inspiring Leader, and you get the really, really tasty boost. And then you can go the College of Lore, so that you get your magical secrets right away at level six. So you can pick up, you know, if you want to have healing spirit, if you want to get aid, if you want to get something like revivify, or just diversify your bardic portfolio a little bit more. You have now the best tools from anywhere you need all in one class. I also think the bards are just renowned as such a good support character already. Yeah. They are there to either buff the allies or debuff the enemies, which as we talked about is the proactive way of being a healer. Precisely. Top that off with a couple healing spells and you're good to go. Yeah, because you're going to be able to use abilities like bardic inspiration or cutting words to turn misses into hits on both sides of the battlefield. And bards get great utility abilities like invisibility, hypnotic pattern, and dimension door. And I think the teleportation offered by a spell like dimension door can actually be a really critical healing tool because if you've got a party member that's dying on the front lines, it might be better for you to run up to them and dimension door them out of there, heal them up, and then bring them back in. Yeah, this whole episode we talk about healing and a lot of people are going to say, well, half the things you mentioned aren't healing. But we're looking at healing from the perspective of reducing damage in combat. Yes. And I think bards are just excellent at doing that. Yeah. I don't think that they have the raw healing potential, 
of the other classes, but the amount of utility that they bring is so clutch that when they augment that with a little bit of healing, you really get a fantastic support character and one that's fun to play and fun to role play as well. Let's talk about the bread and butter of all healing in Dungeons and Dragons, and that is the cleric. Particularly the life domain cleric, which gets such amazing and potent healing abilities. I think the life domain cleric is the one that stands above all the rest. If you are going in here saying, I want to play the dedicated healer, what do I pick? The answer is usually going to be the life domain cleric. The key ability that makes life domain clerics the ultimate healer in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition is the disciple of life ability, which they get right away at first level. This ability means that any healing spell they cast when that spell restores hit points, the creature regains an additional two plus the spell's level in hit points, which goes a long way to make many healing spells that would be horribly inefficient much more efficient. This instantly makes healing word even more useful, just adding a few extra hit points on top of that. Mm -hmm. Every time that you cast it, that's just going to give you a little bit of an extra buffer to make sure that maybe they can survive a couple more rounds. This is also why clerics get very few of the spells that restore more hit points every turn. Because if you do cast a healing spell that is concentration-based that restores hit points every round, Disciple of Life applies every time that spell restores hit points. Clerics are great at dishing out buff spells and damage dealing spells with things like Bless or Spiritual Weapons, Spiritual Guardians. They can really play any end of the combat and be a really vital part to the party. They bring the full kit of healing and support abilities and really do represent that classic healer archetype, the rock at the center of your party. Now, the unexpected one for me is looking at the Druid, who seems to fill a lot of gaps in almost any party, one of which can be the Healer. The Druid is a very adaptable and flexible class, and they really got a lot of upgraded options for healing in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, like the Circle of Dreams, the Circle of the Shepherd, and the Healing Spirit spell, all of which have given Druids a lot more options for contributing as a healer. I think in general, Xanathar's Guide blew open healing in a whole new way. And I think Druids are the ones who tap into that the most. And I do really think that it can't be discredited. A lot of people think of Druids as just wild shaping. They're animalistic, they're nature. Mm -hmm. But with that, there's so many uses that they have around the battlefield at bolstering their allies, bringing really incredible healing spells into combat, and still being able to dish out damage and do all sorts of other really incredible things. The Circle of Dreams Druid gains the Balm of the Summer Court ability, which gives them an extra pool of healing that they can use to restore hit points to their allies. The Druid really upped their healing game with Xanathar's Guide to Everything, and I particularly think that the Circle of the Shepherd is an absolute winner as a healer, for two big reasons. The first of which is the unicorn spirit, spirit totem that they can summon up. When this totem is active, all the allies in the aura of that totem regain hit points equal to the druid's level each time they cast a healing spell. So you as a druid, you cast healing word to bring somebody up, everyone in your party gets hit points equal to your level. That's a lot of healing. Even if the spell targets one person, everybody, everybody gains hit points? Everybody in the aura gains hit points back. It's a lot of healing. Like It's the one case where here's a character that could actually power through it. And you get to have a unicorn. The druid makes a really compelling case for the things that we were discussing with polymorph. Because not only does the druid get the polymorph spell, but they also get spells like conjure animals. And by summoning creatures that merely exist to protect your allies and to take the hits for your allies, you're again, like Polymorph, bringing more hit points onto the battlefield. The more animals that you can sacrifice, the less party members you have to. Which is kind of a very undruid-like thing. Are, there, are they summoned uh, real creatures or are they summoned magically? I mean, you might say that with the Circle of the Shepherd, maybe they are spiritual animals that do exist 
to protect people and that they do willingly give their lives in that way. So we can think about how you might want to actually role play that or spin that as a, as a character. It doesn't change the fact that summoning a pack of wolves and sending them forward into battle to deter and hamper the enemy so they can't get hits in against your vulnerable party members is an amazing strategy and a really, really effective one. I think that between these classes, you can build a dedicated healer. I think that any party that has a paladin to contribute with Lay on Hands will probably be okay. Really, I mean, the paladin's healing abilities is almost enough for most parties to get by. The thing is, paladins want to use their spells to deal damage. It's true. I yeah. took spells as a paladin and barely used them ever. I yeah. just used smite on everything. Lay on hands is a nice stopgap to top up people, but oftentimes I find the paladin is best off using their lay on hands on themselves as that frontliner. It, it's another way of making that paladin feel like someone who's able to soak damage because they can heal themselves up with lay on hands rather than relying on lay on hands being your primary source of healing. I think to summarize everything that we've talked about today, looking at how to play a healer in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, I think one of the most important notes to take away from this is that playing a healer doesn't mean relying on healing magic. Healing magic is meant for very vital and important circumstances that will be game changers if you use them correctly. But really it's about how do you prevent damage? How do you stop the enemies from hurting your allies? How do you bolster your allies before you even get into battle? These are the things that you want to consider when you're playing a healer. When you're building up this character, when you're thinking about how to role play them, what's, what's their purpose on the battlefield? It's really to try to protect their teammates, be that team player, and save everybody's life in the long run. Just like in the real world, preventative medicine is a fantastic way of ensuring long-term health and survival. By the time you've gone into the hospital, you're already in recovery mode. And once the damage has been done, there's nothing to do but mop it back up again. But by playing a healer in a proactive manner, thinking about how you can stay one step ahead of the game, yields, I think, a much more potent and more rewarding play style. And probably it's just a much more interesting and fun character to play, at least for me. Because I think, you know, when you look at video games, people really do complain about that healer playstyle of being so boring. It's not like that at all in Dungeons & Dragons. Healing is more about the strategic survival of your party in combat, in exploration, in the dangerous environments that you're going to be in. And in that way, I think it's a really rewarding and creative style of play to embrace. So this has been our guide to playing a healer in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. If you've played an awesome healer in the past, let us know about it in the comments below. And of course, if you're enjoying the show, please consider supporting the channel on Patreon. You can find out how by following the links in the description below. And if you want to see us struggle through a live play without a healer, check out Dungeons of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we have more guides to the classes in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.